Good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Matthew Van Meter. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the Marketing and Events Coordinator here at Copperfield's Books and I'll also be your host for the evening. Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. I always like to take a moment here in the beginning to thank you all for your support during this challenging year. Um, we wouldn't be able to offer this free program without the sales of event books, and we at Copperfields are so very grateful for that. So just a couple of quick housekeeping items before I introduce tonight's author. Uh, we will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, uh, links for purchasing tonight's title, as well as a 10% discount code for use on our website and we'll also include my contact details for post-event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to tonight with any questions or comments for the speaker. The format will feature between 35 to 45 minutes of speaking and then will be followed by a live Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see an icon that says Q&A. Please, please submit your questions here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce tonight's author, Matthew Van Meter. Matthew Van Meter works with people whose voices have been ignored or silenced, both as a journalist and as the assistant director of Shakespeare in Prison. His reporting on criminal justice has appeared in The Atlantic and The New Republic, and he is currently editing the first critical edition of Shakespeare written entirely by incarcerated people. Raised Quaker on the East Coast, he now lives in Detroit. And Matthew is here with us tonight to discuss his book, Deep Delta Justice, A Black Teen, His Lawyer, and Their Groundbreaking Battle for Civil Rights in the South. And I know we're all so excited to dive in and to take this much needed break from watching the elections. And um, I'm so excited to hand it over to you, Matthew. Why don't you take it away for us? Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. I'm really, really pleased um, to be here and with you all. And j looking, just glancing at the list of attendees, it's sort of uh, uh, um, all sorts of people I, I don't know. And, and feel free to, to put in the chat where you're, uh, uh, where you're joining us from and, and, a, and a bunch of people I do know. And so it feels, feels a little like a homecoming, which is really nice for me. Um, so, so tonight I want to talk um, because uh, this week is so important um, in American politics and really in American history, I, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of elections. Um, and and since you know, from from my perspective anyway, the current election news is pretty promising, uh, including my my adoptive home state of Michigan, uh, 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 as of as of very recently, I, I want to talk a little bit about how to survive and recover from a white supremacist dictatorship and what we can learn. From the experience of Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana. Um, but first, I should set you up a little bit. Um, so uh, I give you Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana. So Plaquemines Parish is uh, at the end of the Mississippi River. It is southeast of New Orleans. If you've ever been to New Orleans, you know that there's not, not a whole lot southeast of there. Much of the book takes place in Boothville, which is what's pictured now on the screen. It is this last couple of miles of land eked out between the levees. You can see the river there with ships going up and down it. Um, and then this vast sort of trackless marsh beyond. Um, and it's really the end of the road. There's not much beyond Plaquemines Parish, except for marsh and then the Gulf of Mexico some oil rigs. Um, and I, th I think the best way to put you there is just to read a couple of paragraphs from the first chapter of the book. So Plaquemines Parish is the end of the road. It sits at the extreme end of the Mississippi River, southeast of New Orleans, almost entirely surrounded by the Gulf of Mexico. The river built it and the river defined it. Every granule of earth that made up Plaquemines had been carried by water from the Great Plains or the Appalachians or the Rockies, eventually building a delta in the shape of a bird's foot. From its source in Minnesota to its mouth near Boothville, 
the Mississippi River carved a 2,300 mile path through the interior of the United States, forming the third most populous river basin in the world. The mouth of the Mississippi, in Plaquemines, was the anchor of a vast expanse of marshland that stretched from the Everglades to Mexico. The marsh had always drawn people to Plaquemines. Only 5% of the land was uh, lay between the levees and could be built on. The rest was wetlands fretted with bayous and great fields of grass that overflowed with life. There were even settlements out there, tiny clutches of wooden shacks built on stilts, accessible only by boat, where people subsisted on what they could shoot or trap or catch in a net. But for most of the parish's 24,000 residents, life existed on the narrow ribbon of land built between the levees. Everything in Plaquemines was either up the road or down the road. You know, and for me, uh, that was actually one of the things about Plaquemines that uh, was most disorienting at first. It was the strangest. You literally can't get lost down there. There's just the one road on the East Bank and, and an even smaller one, a uh, 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 somewhat larger one on the West Bank. There, there aren't any wrong turns to make, uh, despite the fact that it's just 15 or 20 minutes from downtown New Orleans to the parish line. Plaquemines is one of the most isolated places in the United States, at least by land and certainly culturally. Um, in the 1960s, when Deep Delta Justice pl takes place, uh, there was just the one road connecting it to the rest of civilization. Um, for a long time, Plaquemines had been poor. Ships passed by on their way to New Orleans, but Plaquemines didn't have a port. It had tons of wildlife, oysters and fish and shrimp and all sorts of birds, but, um, uh, and it was at one time the largest producer of furs in the United States. But fishing and hunting and trapping don't really generate real money. Um, the real money, uh, as is so often true in American history, the real money is in oil. So in the early 20th century, oil was discovered in the marsh led to a boom that went on for decades. Um, and I'm sure everybody here recalls Deepwater Horizon, right? The, the uh, offshore oil rig that uh, was gushing oil into the Gulf for uh, days on end. Um, that, that and all of the other offshore oil rigs in the Gulf uh, off the coast of Louisiana are based in Plaquemines. It's a place with two heliports and no airport. Um, and those heliports serve the offshore rigs. So in the early 20th century, the money started coming in. You know, so Plaquemines was an isolated backwater, natural bottleneck. Uh, suddenly, improbably, it was blessed with this, uh, uh, one of the greatest concentrations of petroleum in the world. And these, these oil rigs, uh, like the one that's, that's pictured, uh, still dot the Gulf. It's, it's a little eerie, actually, when you go out you know, if you go out on a boat, um, they're just sort of scattered around. Um, they're just mostly just sort of left there, um, uh, which at first I thought was was uh, uh, just sort of an eyesore. It turns out it's actually, uh, at this point, we've destroyed enough of the marsh down there that that's one of the few things that, uh, uh, um, that the marsh wildlife has to hang on to. Um, but in any case, the parish was rich in oil. It was a natural bottleneck. Um, which sounds like a pretty good place to uh, try to exert your political power. And that's just what happened. Uh, Leander H. Perez, known as the judge, although he was only a judge for about five years of his 50 year career, came to power in Plaquemines in 1919. He didn't relinquish control over the parish until his death in 1969. And for those five decades, he controlled life in Plaquemines to a degree that would have made him the envy of more familiar dictators in other nations. Um, for a long time, Perez used his power to crush his political adversaries, including, and this is true, and I encourage you to look it up, um, an armed standoff with the National Guard during World War II uh, that went down in Louisiana political history as the Little War, because I guess uh, World War II was the big war. Uh, uh, Perez was uh, uh, particularly known for saying things that other people knew better than to say, um, or should have known better than to say. Um, and that made him both uh, polarizing and beloved by certain segments of the population. 
But then 1954 rolled around and the Supreme Court unanimously decided Brown versus Board of Education and Perez, who had been a racist before, but hadn't ever really like specifically targeted the black people who lived in Plaquemines, announced a few days later that he was dedicating his life to preserving the segregation of the races. And that was when he changed from oddball Louisiana political figure to one of the most famous segregationists in America. Nationally, Perez was known uh, for being willing to say the overtly racist things that other segregationists had learned to be more careful about. In fact, he delighted in breaking those norms, in saying the unsayable, in speaking aloud the id of Southern segregationists, and it should be said, the id of a lot of Northerners too. So Perez declared war on the Black people in his community in the 1950s, and that brings us to one of the main characters of the book, Gary Duncan. So Gary grew up in Boothville, right, which is that second to last town accessible by road on the Mississippi River. Uh, Gary grew up in a big, boisterous family full of fiercely independent men and women. Their father, Lambert, was the first black man to run crew boats for the segregated oil industry. Um, he actually used to sleep on his boat to keep his white competitors from setting the boat on fire. And the whole family was really deeply involved in the church. And so in October of 1966, Gary had just turned 19. He was newly married. His first child had been born just days before. And he was driving down the road, the one road on the west bank of the Mississippi. And uh, at this spot, which looked very similar at the time, uh, uh, as, as this picture from 2018, uh, he saw something. He saw two of his relatives, their kids, middle schoolers, uh, they were talking to four white kids, uh, no big deal, except for two things. Uh, Gary knew that the schools had just been desegregated by a federal court order, so racial tensions were high, especially in school, and he didn't like that. And the other thing he didn't like was that there were white men, adults, standing on the other side of the road and watching by the sort of green building in the picture. So Gary got out of the car. He broke up this fight that was about to happen. And right when he was about to go, he put his, his hand on the arm of one of the white boys and he said, best run along home. And if you followed the news recently, you probably know what happened next. One of the white men who was watching all of this called the cops and Gary got arrested and he was charged with battery. Um, but Gary's family, uh, it must be said, they're all blessed and cursed with a, a particularly overdeveloped sense of justice. Um, so rather than lying down and taking it, Gary lawyered up. Um, and that brings me to the other main character of the story, and that's Richard Sobel. Uh, Sobel was 29 in 1966. He was bright, ambitious. He was intense. Um, uh, one of his, uh, one, one of the lawyers who worked on this case with him eventually, Anthony Amsterdam, uh, legendary uh, civil rights attorney, uh, described him to me in an interview once as Angel Ross, who's the main, the, uh, the um, uh, leader of the revolutionaries in Les Miserables. Uh, uh, Richard was totally out of place in New Orleans in one sense. He was Jewish. He's from New York City. He's third in his class at Columbia Law School. He had never really spent any time to speak of in the South, uh, certainly not the Deep South. But in 1965, he volunteered his vacation days to take civil rights cases, and he caught the bug. And so in 1966, he quit his fancy job at one of the nation's most prestigious law firms to take civil rights cases in New Orleans. Um, and he was part of a small army of lawyers who went down to enforce the hard-won victories of the civil rights movement. And I think it's worth pausing for a minute to th think about the implications of that statement. I know I hadn't really thought of the army of lawyers who went down to enforce the civil rights movement until I started working on this book. Um, and that's because the story we tell about the civil rights movement usually begins with Emmett Till and Brown versus Board of Education in the early 1950s, um, hits some of the highlights after that, the sit-ins, Freedom Rides, uh, Freedom Summer, 
uh, I Have a Dream, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, uh, ends basically with the passage of the Civil and Voting Rights Acts in 1964 and 1965, respectively. And then maybe we mumble something about like sanitation workers or Detroit or black power or other things that um, in general make us uncomfortable. And then we fast forward to Dr. King's assassination in 1968. And that martyrdom, that moment gives us uh, both a tidy conclusion um, and also a sense that something concrete was accomplished and now we can wash our hands of it. And something concrete was accomplished. I'm not gonna badmouth those victories, but the truth of it, is that that story about the civil rights movement is really just the beginning. Um, and take Brown versus Board of Education, for instance. Um, my, uh, if I remember, my high school history class did not exactly dwell on the fact that the Supreme Court outlawed school segregation in 1954, but the first big city to desegregate was New Orleans in 1960, six years later. Uh, uh, and Memphis, Memphis, Tennessee, still hadn't desegregated 18 years later in 1972 when that lawsuit was filed. And I'm not even talking here about like de facto segregation, uh, you know, like, like we have in the North and, uh, and, and today. Uh, this is like old school, straight up de jure segregation, separate schools for people of different races. And with very, very few exceptions, school districts in the South just simply ignored Brown versus Board of Education. And they ignored the Civil Rights Act and they ignored the Voting Rights Act because there's no Supreme Court police. There's no congressional police. The justices just say stuff and the rest of us need to figure out how to make it happen. And lawmakers just make laws and that's nice, but someone has to enforce them. And enforcement means lawsuits. It means hundreds of lawsuits, thousands of them. A lawsuit against every recalcitrant school district, government, municipality, business, union, organization that refuse to comply with federal law. And lawsuits means lawyers lots of lawyers. Uh, and let me tell you, like most Southern white lawyers were not jumping at the chance to litigate desegregation cases in their own communities. There weren't, an, and there weren't enough Southern black lawyers to do all of that work, um, especially because it pays uh, very little, if anything at all. Uh, and furthermore, the, the uh, Southern law schools had just recently desegregated. There weren't that many black lawyers in the South to begin with. So lawyers came mostly from the North and West, especially from New York City. Um, they were particularly likely to be the children and grandchildren of Eastern European Jews who had survived pogroms and ghettos and the Holocaust. You know, and that brings me back to Richard Sobel. So he was part of that massive wave of lawyers. We're very much like him um, in a lot of ways. They came down to make good on the promises made by the Supreme Court and Congress. Um, long after most Americans had turned their attention elsewhere. And he worked for years with three young radical black attorneys and a host of brave clients to bring racial integration to the South. You know, but Richard stood out among the mem members of this lawyer army um, because he was among the smartest, if not the smartest of them, the most dedicated and the most creative of them. Um, he was a very influential lawyer in the early days of Title VII law, which is employment discrimination, uh, and a mind-bogglingly successful litigator of everything from school desegregation cases to uh, injunctions intended to curb police brutality. Uh, the list of cases that he won in just a few years in the 60s is really something to see. And so Richard took Gary's case, which was an insignificant misdemeanor case, a battery case, you know, one that on the surface had nothing to do with race at all, though, of course, it had everything to do with race. Um, and against Gary and Richard stood Leander Perez, who was the most powerful segregationist in, Louis uh, in Louisiana, uh, one of the most powerful in the country the dictator of Plaquemines Parish, a man who had been a parish judge and then prosecutor, but who for 20 years had been referred to quite seriously as the third house of the Louisiana legislature. And the district attorney who was in charge of Gary's prosecution was Leander Perez Jr., the old man's son. So that's where the book begins. And you'll have to read more to see what comes next. But 
Um, I promise you, I talk a little bit about elections and about how to survive a white supremacist dictatorship. So this story, which started almost 55 years ago, um, is continues to be relevant today. You know, we're living in a time of really terrible uh, regional, racial, um, and political division. Um, I think we can see that we're facing a gathering storm of resistance to the rule of law um, and to the hard won civil rights victories of the past. Um, and, you know, if you look at voting rights for our police departments or our ever more segregated schools and neighborhoods, I think it's pretty clear that something's coming to a head. And when things come to a head in America, they head to court. And we'll need more people like Richard Sobel and Gary Duncan to win those fights. You know, when it comes to voting rights, uh, nothing has ever impressed on me the importance of that right uh, more than watching the, the Duncan family. The first time I, I spent time with them and they're this loud sort of uh, uh, boisterous, wonderful, you know, litigious family of, you know, ar arguing back and forth. You know, I've seen, seen arguments over the use of filet and gumbo nearly come to blows, um, uh, but just, just full, of, full of love. And I remember asking one of them, I believe it was Vivian Duncan, Gary's eldest sister, um, when she registered to vote. And she opened up her wallet and she showed me her registration card, which had the, date, had the date of her registration. And it was 1962. And she was super proud of that. And it took me a second to realize why, what was unspoken to her that I needed to understand, which was that the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965 and Leander Perez was one of the architects of the voter disenfranchisement and intimidation laws that became part of Jim Crow. He specifically personally wrote the constitutional interpretation test and a number of other laws in, um, intended to deny black people the right to vote. And she had beaten those tests in 1962 because they hadn't been outlawed until 1965. Um, and that's a, I, I, I carry that with me, that Gary was too young to vote before the Voting Rights Act, but a number of his siblings, he's the youngest of nine, uh, still carry those voting cards, the registration cards with them with their pre-Voting Rights Act dates of registration, um, because that means something to them. You know, and I, I, I think about, um, you know, we had pretty good turnout in this last election, something like 65% of registered voters in America came out to the polls. And I'm grateful for that. Um, and I'm also really conscious of the, <laughs> the remainder of folks, the 35% of Amer registered voters who didn't come out to vote. Um, and what that says to people like the Duncans who suffered through so much and worked so hard to be able to exercise that right and to really know what it means because for them, having lived in this, uh, what was truly a dictatorship run by Leander Perez for, uh, for Gary's siblings their entire lives, they understood that when Perez died in 1969, leaving a vacuum of power, that was not the end of the work, that was the beginning of it. That the important thing about seeing out the demagogue who had had his boots on their necks for decades was not celebrating their victory, it was about getting down to business and it took years to undo the laws that Perez had passed. And I think about that in the moment we're in right now, um, as you know, I and a lot of the people I know are inclined to, to sort of celebrate what seems like, hopefully, um, 
a sort of uh, a, a, a positive moment in a, in a dark several years passage of American history. But I'm also really conscious after having done the research for this book of how much work we have to do because, you know, when it came to Perez, it was not like the, the white people in Plaquemines Parish uh, remember Perez uh, mostly not positively at this point, but they mostly remember him for the things that he said, right? Which were shocking and they were racist and they were, you know, uh, in a sort of photogenic way that um, is, I mean, continues to be shocking to this day. It wasn't that long ago. Um, but in the dozens of interviews I had with Black residents of Plaquemines, not one of them mentioned Perez's offensive speech or his breaking of norms. <laughs> they mentioned the laws that he passed that denied them their constitutional rights and how long it took after his death to undo those laws. Um, and so I think if this election goes the way that, that I hope it does, um, I hope we remember that we've got, we've got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. And I hope that readers of the book can take hope from it and also take the lesson of how hard it is to overcome the demons of our past. So I think with that, I wanna close with a, a reading from a portion of the book, uh, a little bit towards the end, sort of, again, sort of an election themed moment. Um, this one, this one fairly hopeful. So, so bear with me, it be, um, should take about a minute or so. So on November 4th, 1967, election day, six federal election observers showed up early in the morning to their makeshift Plaquemines Parish headquarters in the Bell Chase post office. Three of them crossed the street to the fire department where they would be helping blacks fill out voter registration forms and overseeing the casting of ballots. At 8.20 a.m., a short white man in a three-piece suit burst into the fire department flanked by two taller men. If the observers didn't know him already, the telltale cigar hanging from the man's mouth gave away his identity. Leander Perez saying he was a parish official uh, turned to one observer who was seated and growled, please stand up and show respect. Yes, sir, said the bemused observer and he stood. The man wrote down their names and tossed back their documents, muttering that they were federal spies who were part of a second reconstruction. I'd rather eat shit, he spat, than do this sort of spying. One observer recalled that the man began talking about things that did not make sense, but were directed as insults towards us. After 10 or 15 minutes, the irate man suddenly left the building. The three officials sat for a moment in stunned silence, and then one went back to the post office to talk the incident over with his boss. Shortly after he entered that office, the door swung open, and there, was, and there was the man again. Introducing himself as Tom Hicks, Perez repeated the scene from across the road. He counted the observers, skipping the one he had seen previously. There are three more across the street, he said to them, and that makes six of you federal bastards out here. He, again, he asked for identification and wrote down the names. Then, snatching the list of federally eligible voters, he held it aloft and said sarcastically, I suppose I cannot look at this. And when they responded that he was welcome to it, he thumbed through, grunting at a few of the names in disgust. He tossed the book down and walked toward the counter. There, he grabbed a briefcase, turned it upside down, and shook it until pens and paper clips and, bags of, and pages of documents fell to the floor and scattered like leaves. Where in hell are the machine guns, he said. I know damn well there must be some. He repeated the process with the other briefcases and then began rummaging in the filing cabinets, the observers watching silently as he ransacked their office. What's the matter? Don't you have any arms? Where are your machine guns? What kind of people are you anyway? The man asked too loudly. Having failed to discover a massive federal armory, the man stalked out, flaked, flanked by his compatriots. As he flung the door open and thrust himself out, he ran straight into a black man coming up the steps, nearly knocking him over. Both men were silent for a moment, standing inches from each other. 
What's he doing here? demanded Perez, turning back to the observers. They made no reply. I want to know, he thundered. His friends took him by the arm and led him back across the parking lot and back to his car. When he was gone, the black man continued up the short stoop, crossed the threshold, and stepped forward to register, for the first time in his life, to vote. I'll be happy to take questions. Sorry, was having video problems. That was fantastic. And I definitely want to know more. And I'm so glad that you stopped because we have a couple questions. Um, so let me just get right to them. Penelope is wondering, um, her question is, I am curious to hear about how you approached Gary's family to interview them. How did they respond to you initially? I am attempting to write a historical fiction novel that takes place partly in the South during and after the Civil War. And I wonder how to approach Southerners about their lifestyles and beliefs that motivate them. Um, so uh, Gary, who's, who's a, a, a good friend, um, was a little skeptical of me at first. Um, I approached him through Richard. Um, so I got a hold of Richard Sobel because uh, I, was, I started this book when I was in grad school um, at Columbia, which is where he went to law school. And um, I, <laughs> I, took, I took a letter uh, that I had written and, and put in a, in a stamped envelope um, to the like alumni folks at the law school and asked if they would kindly like, I knew that they couldn't give out addresses, but if they would send it on to him and, and they did, and he got right back to me um, with an email and, and, and eventually put me in touch with Gary. Gary was, um, Gary was wary of me. Um, I think I would have been wary of me, uh, you know, like whatever I was, <laughs> I was 30 years old, like, you know, bright eyed, bushy tailed 30 year old Yankee white boy, like coming down to to Louisiana gonna like you know gonna tell his story you know but I can't pay him a dime like I it's um I think I would have been wary of me too and um but I think I think through a combination of of showing up a lot um and and also um one of the things that I was really happy to do you know I, I mean I can't as a journalist I can't pay for stories obviously but I understood Gary's um uh, feeling of unease about my, you know, <laughs> ma ma making a living off of his story when he wasn't allowed to make a cent, sort of ethically. Um, and so, so what, what we ended up agreeing on was, was that a, a portion of the proceeds of this book go to support his church, um, Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church, which was one of the, the real, um, I mean, just one of the cornerstone institutions in Plaquemines Parish in the underground fight against Jim Crow and particularly for voter registration. This is a church where people were smuggled down, like activists smuggled down in the trunks of cars from New Orleans in the middle of the night because black churches were the one place that black people in Plaquemines Parish could gather um, without being disrupted by the police because the police, I guess, figured that it was just, you know, a bunch of, you know, crazy black folks in church or something. And, and, uh, but they, they weren't praying. Uh, I mean, they were doing that too, but they, they were studying how to beat the constitutional interpretation test. They were studying how to get around the Jim Crow laws written by Perez um, that were, that were specifically designed to stop them from voting. Um, and it worked, you know, it was, I mean, it was hard work, but it, and, and there's a whole chapter in the book sort of detailing the, the links that Perez went to, to, to keep black people from, from voting, um, which, which are, which would be comic if they weren't so, uh, evil. Um, but there was, there was a time when, you know, some, like a, a, a huge proportion, something like one in five of the, um, of the, uh, registered black voters in Plaquemines Parish were were named Duncan um, uh, before the Voting Rights Act, and so uh, I, I went a little bit far, farther afield on that question, but I, I it sort of loops back to it. It was the going back again and again, and the and the showing of, um, you know, it wasn't about the money. It was about a, it was about a it was it was about respect, right, for the story, for what Gary went through, for what his community has gone through. Um, and, you know, at, like since that time, I was, you know, almost five years ago, 
Um, you know, Gary's become a really good friend. I, I talked to him on election night. Uh, he was, he was, at, he's still a tugboat captain. He was out in his tugboat. I could hear the diesel engine in the background. Uh, and, um, you know, he's, he, he has been to me, like quite apart from the main character of the book, you know, he's been a source of, um, real, like, you know, love and, and friendship and, and, and companionship over the, over the years as well. Oh my gosh, that's so awesome in its own. I feel like that's its own tale almost. <laughs> um, Ted is wondering, is Matthew working on any other projects? We want more of his work. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, I've got a couple of, couple of irons in the fire. Uh, and um, one, one of them is most, mostly local stuff. Uh, and uh, one, one of them, the one that I'm sort of working on currently, um, is a, a local, that is to me, Detroit story um, that uh, pits a bunch of like radical anarchist, you know, like proto-punk potheads against the Nixon administration and sort of a pre-Watergate showdown in the early 70s. Um, so, so stay tuned. <laughs> Um, all right, Anne is wondering, what is the political landscape like there now? In Plaquemines? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so, so Plaquemines is uh, quite, quite conservative. It's, uh, you know, it's changed a lot since the 60s. Um, you know, and I've talked to Gary a lot about that. I mean, a, a bit because of two things. I mean, basically because of the decline of the oil industry there and, and the relatively low uh, oil prices. And also because uh, of Hurricane Katrina, which uh, I mean, Hurricane Katrina was was quite devastating in New Orleans. Um, it was apocalyptic in Plaquemines Parish. Um, there were something like six buildings that survived without damage in the entire parish of 25,000 people. So, um, I mean, it was really, um, it was really uh, completely devastated and, and, and largely depopulated, particularly because it's nearly impossible to get flood insurance down there. Um, so you have to be either wealthy or quite reckless to be a homeowner and, or, or have nowhere else to go uh, to be a homeowner in Plaquemines Parish right now. You know, and, and, and that, that, that scattered the Duncan family, honestly. Uh, you know, they live, you know, they all, they all still go to church at Mount Olive, but, you know, that's like an hour and a half drive each way for Gary now. So that, so, so, so Hurricane Katrina was, was really, um, uh, really depopulated and sort of scattered the parish's residents. And, and then with the, with the decline of, of high paying jobs there, I mean, that used to be the thing and, and readers of the book will know that a lot of the first chapter talks about, I mean, it was just this, Blackman's in the 1960s was this land of plenty. I mean, you could, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes was a, uh, a librarian who, who declined, excuse me, to give her name, but she gave this great anecdote uh, uh, when I was just sort of talking to folks down there a bunch of years ago. She, uh, she remembered, so she had this really clear memory that was confirmed by a couple of others of um, like people from Alabama, Texas, Mississippi, who would like get a bus ticket and they would just like walk, you know, to, to the nearest bus station. They would just like walk down the road in, in a suit with a briefcase and walk into the oil company offices. Because if you were, if you were a white person in Plaquemines Parish and you walked in there, you got a job. And that job would, would support a middle-class lifestyle. Um, and that, that's all gone. And so it's, it's a place where, um, of, it's a place of great poverty. Um, it's a place of some some limited wealth, uh, but and and, so, and still some political power. But it, it is also, I should say, being eaten alive by sea level rise. Um, there's not a lot of land to give there, and the, the levees are huge, especially since Katrina. But um, they've lost uh, a, a really mind-boggling amount of uh, marshland. Um, you know, the, the average rate of marshland loss in the state of Louisiana since 1980 is uh, about a football field's worth an hour. Um, and that, that doesn't quite cover the extent of it because that's an average since 1980 um, and it has accelerated. Um, also, since most of that land gets, you know, washed away in storms all at once rather than it's not a, a sort of steady linear decline, but 
you know, if you, I mean, just in the time I've been going down to Plaquemines, like you go, there's this one bridge, the high rise where you get up and see over the levees and as you're driving down, and I've just seen the Gulf go from as far as the eye can see away to like lapping at the levees um, just in the past couple of years. So all of that has made the political situation in Plaquemines really dire. Um, like I said, it is quite conservative. It is also a place where, um, because, because the smaller the pie gets, the more people fight for pieces of it, that has become quite fractious and divided, not only along racial lines, but along class and ethnic lines as well. So it's, um, it's a, it is in, in, in a lot of ways a difficult place to be right there. Um, and and I, I know a lot of people who live down the road um, and you know, unless they're like retirees or in some other way have have a have a kind of fixed, uh, you know, livable income, um, uh, or 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 at the military base. Like Pla Plaquemines is a um, it's a tough place to be raising a family. It's a tough place to be a young person, um, and that's uh, really like brought about a lot of the same problems that are hitting rural Americans all over the place, um, and and really driven them into the arms of Trump. Thanks for that. Um, Genevieve is wondering, are you currently practicing law and is it related to your passion for this subject? <laughs> so, so full, full disclosure, not, not a lawyer, just interested. Um, I, yeah, so not, not practicing law. I'm a, I'm a, uh, among other things, I do Shakespeare in prison. I'm a school teacher, teach college, do journalism, whatever, try to stay one step ahead of the repo man. Um, uh, but most, mostly I'm an educator and a, and a journalist. Um, so, uh, but yeah, my, I mean, my passion for the law comes from, uh, com comes from a few places. It's, it's something I've always been interested in and, and something I've, I've always been like, uh, felt an affinity for. And, um, you know, the law drives away some journalists because, because it's difficult to understand. It's arcane. You know, and I found that I was, I was fairly good at taking those concepts and explaining them for a general audience, which is not something that all lawyers are good at all the time. Um, and so, so I just sort of like, you know, stumbled into it in a sense, you know, and, and also I think for me, like, you know, I was raised a Quaker, my family's been Quaker for, you know, who knows how many generations. And, and so like, it's one of the, it's one of the places where I can be part of the, the very the broad struggle for for equal justice in a way that sort of leverages my strengths and, and you know and the law is right at the forefront of that well we kind of have we have a, a bunch of questions about shakespeare in prison and i'll leave time for that i promise um okay. last question we have that we're going to get to here around the book is M Margaret and quite a few people are wondering um are there attorneys like richard sobel still working in the area for civil rights and if you can speak any more about Richard. Yeah, um, so Richard, Richard was, uh, I'll, I'll start with the, with the Richard part of that. So I mean, this was, um, you know, an early phase in Richard's career. He went on to, and, and frankly, you know, Duncan versus Louisiana, which is Gary's case, uh, reached the Supreme Court. It's this landmark victory about the right to jury trial. Um, you know, and obviously, you know, read on in the book about that if you, if you are interested, but it was, it was not the most, uh, important case that Richard worked on in a lot of ways. And he was, uh, I mentioned, a, sort of an architect of the early interpretation of Title VII law, which is in, in, uh, em employment discrimination under the Civil Rights Act. Um, so I was, you know, that was sort of what won him prominence among civil rights lawyers at the time. Um, and he went on to be a, a really important lawyer in, in, that, in the field of, of equal justice uh, for, for decades afterwards. I mean, he was like, he was so young when this all happened. Um, and he was just a, a, a really bright light in that field, even when it was a less prominent um, it, you know, there was less sort of attention paid, uh, you know, at, at, at certain times in our history. And, and Richard, um, sadly, Richard passed away this spring um, and he was in, in, in Sebastopol, um, California, where he, where he retired to. And, um, you know, I was fortunate enough to spend some time with, with Richard and his wife, Anne, who I think is in the, is, uh, attending the event, um, and, and Gary and his wife, Faye, all together, um, 
uh, almost a year ago uh, before before Richard passed. And uh, you know, so he, you know, his his legacy I think speaks for itself. Um, and you know, fortunately, even despite despite COVID and everything else that was going on. Um, both the Associated Press and the New York Times ran really lovely obituaries for him, um, which which I think was really important for him. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy that the book is able to contribute in some ways towards his legacy. In terms of lawyers doing that work today, yeah, there are tons of them. Um, the work still doesn't pay very much. Um, it's mostly not very sexy. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a grind. Um, and with with the with the expense of law schools these days, um, I, I worry that people who are not independently wealthy um, might find it difficult to go into the sort of work that Richard did, which means we're going to lose a lot of the brightest minds that we have um, just because it's, it is such hard work. I mean, emotionally, intellectually, um, for, for so little, uh, uh, you know, sort of job security and compensation. You know, and that, that was true at the time, but it just like it, it, it law school has gotten so much more expensive and the gap in pay between, say, corporate lawyers and um, and people doing civil rights lawyer has just grown. Um, and so I, I worry about what that means for the current crop of law students uh, right now as they're, as they're thinking about not, not what they want to do, but what they can do. Um, so I, I worry about that in, in the future, but the, yeah, there are zillions <laughs> of lawyers who are doing either at firms as pro bono work or, you know, as public defenders, as civil rights attorneys, as immigration attorneys, um, you know, working for the ACLU and affiliates. I mean, there are lawyers, you know, um, hundreds of them, probably thousands of them in the country doing, doing, doing that sort of work. You know, we need, we need all of them. <laughs> we need all of them. You know, I have such respect and admiration for the way that you covered this topic. And I think it goes without saying that, you know, that passion, it, it puts light on a topic that is both current and historical. And I just, there's so much appreci appreciation coming in from people thanking you for taking the time to tackle such a big subject. Um, and yeah, I just thank you for that before we kind of touch on the next thing, which is Shakespeare in prison. Everyone wants to know about that. So tell us more. So uh, Shakespeare in prison is uh, a very small nonprofit organization. We are the, um, the, the signature community program of Detroit Public Theater, which is a, um, a professional theater company here in Detroit. Um, although we predate the theater by a couple of years. So we were started in 2012. I started with Shakespeare in Prison in 2013, just as a volunteer when we had a budget of zero dollars. <laughs> um, and so we, over the course of a, a year long season or not uh, like, you know, like a, a 10 month long season, we read and discuss and rehearse and perform a full play of Shakespeare. In, uh, with a group of about two dozen incarcerated people. Um, our sort of home base is at the women's prison in Ypsilanti, Michigan. Um, um, although we've had programs at youth facilities, we um, for, for several years had a program in a men's facility in Jackson, Michigan. Um, and it is, I mean, particularly when I was writing the book, it was, um, it was sometimes the one place where I had any social interaction um, was, was in the prisons. And it's I mean, it's, it's a little hard to know what to say about it. It was um, like the act of putting on those plays is um, is so empowering for the people who do it, uh, in part because it, it is, um, and it's part of why we use Shakespeare. I mean, it, it is challenging, um, like uniformly challenging for everybody who participates in the program, um, not just because of the language or the fear of getting up and acting, but frankly, the fear of like trusting other people not to let you down. Um, and, uh, and, and learning to, to like to work as an ensemble together with all of these other people to produce something uh, of to produce something of worth and, and beauty, um, which is something that has often been lacking in the lives of our participants for one reason or another. Um, and it, it creates this really strong sense of community um, around positivity and accountability and support 
Um, and we were also really, really lucky to be uh, one of the very few programs in the world to have essentially unfettered access to our alumni. So we're currently in touch with more than 100 um, folks who are on the outside who have gotten out of prison, you know, and regu in regular touch with, with a few dozen of them um, who live all over the state of Michigan and all over the country um, and, and, and continue to, particularly since because of COVID and particularly because Michigan prisons were hit especially hard, the men's prison where we were located was at a t uh, was for a time the largest COVID cluster in the United States, um, uh, and you know, and I, I, a lot of the people I worked with were, got sick. Um, so we've been able to pivot our program to um, to focus largely on our alums, who are wonderful and and uh, uh, just terrifyingly accomplished and 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 delightful, uh, and. Uh, you know, and a really uh, that that has added a lot to my life, and I think Shakespeare in Prison has added a lot to their lives. And, and there's this this there's this community, this kind of metaphysical community and a literal community. And we have these like you know weekly Zoom meetings where where they can get on and, and sort of check in if they want to. And we're work you know we work on projects together, and we're just you know they can call us after a bad day, you know, after they've been denied you know, housing again, you know, because of their felony record or can't get a job or whatever and just need to vent to someone, you know, with whom they have an uncomplicated relationship. Like we can, we can be there for them. And that's, um, that's a really wonderful thing. So that's, I don't know how good an overview that was, but that's, that's sort of my nutshell of Shakespeare in prison. Um, that is really wonderful. I'm wondering, is there a place, a website or, you know, where people may donate or people might learn more yeah. about it? Absolutely. Um, and I can, I can drop it can, in the, if I can multitask, I can put it in the chat. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, but if you Google Shakespeare in prison, we, we, we are the, there are a bunch of organizations like ours. We are the only one of that name. Um, and, uh, we are at, uh, so, and, or if you go to Detroit public, public theater. Theater. Org. Okay. I found it. So I'll put that in the Great. chat. Thank you. No Thanks, problem. Jane. Yeah, no, and we are, um, the other thing we're doing actually is we uh, we got approval to, to run a, a sort of essentially a correspondence course. So we're making these uh, activity packs that are based around passages of Shakespeare's plays to send in because, you know, because our people inside um, have been on lockdown since March, you know, and like, I think I'm going stir crazy in my tiny little apartment, but like, oh, you know, my. their cell is the size of this room. Yeah, and there might be four people in there, and that's it for months. Oh, man. They haven't I, seen, you know, they haven't seen their families because um, they're not allowed to have visits. Uh, I mean, it's really pretty dire. And so for them to receive, I mean, just a piece of mail, but a piece of mail that has like, you know, hours worth of activities and, and you know, th sort of thought-provoking, you know, prompts for whatever they might want to do has... Um, uh, we've heard from folks who are getting out now um, who were, you know, who were on lockdown for months because of COVID, that that's, that's sort of a lifeline for a lot of people. That's truly incredible. And like I told you before the event, I feel like that could be its own Zoom series. I mean, right. I don't watch that, but okay. I know we're, you know, getting close to the end here. So I want to thank you again and remind all of you that I will be sending an email tomorrow that will include a link to rewatch this, all the information for how to buy, how to get the 10% off code. So if all you did tonight was watch, don't worry, everything will be there tomorrow. And I like to just take us out with a couple quotes and, and things that people have said. One is Mike Lee said, illuminating book. Um, we appreciate your teaching from the Lee family. So I'm assuming you know them um, and just, you know, so many people thanking you for taking the time to cover this subject, saying they don't know how you have so much time to cover all of this and, and lots of admiration. So thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. And any last things you want to leave us with before we wrap up? I, I, I don't think so. Um, I, I th well, I think the one, the one thing to say is that like, for, for me, the biggest, the biggest takeaway from this book, but also from the from the process of reporting the book and and talking about it and just and, and getting to know the people involved, is is like just how important it is, some sometimes as both Gary and Richard were to just to be completely unreasonable, in the pursuit of justice, um, and I, I hope we we hold that 
lesson close in the months and years to come. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who joined us this evening. Um, we hope to see you back very soon. I hope you all stay well and healthy and uh, see you on the other side. Thanks so much, folks. Thank you.